All right, it's week four, it's Monday, and uh, this week I'm going to teach you something called backtracking. Backtracking is a particular usage of recursion. So we're going to build on what we learned last week. And uh, the good news is if you're still figuring out recursion, if recursion is still tricky, which I think it probably is for a lot of you, we're just going to keep practicing it more and more, and hopefully the longer we spend in this world of recursion, the more you will feel comfortable. So that's good news. Homework three, which is about recursion, is up on the website. It's due this Friday. Uh, I know the pace of the assignments is fairly rapid. Every week there's a new assignment. It's going to slow down a little. It's going to start being every week plus a lecture. So for example, homework four is not due next Friday. It's going to be due the Monday after that. And so I know that uh, a week is ambitious deadline for an assignment. Part of the reason we've had several due in a week like this is because we're trying to separate our turn-in schedule from 106A so that the layer is not even more of a mess than it already is with so many people on the same day. Um, anyway, just FYI, that's where we are in the class right now. We're doing uh, this uh, concept called backtracking. So without further ado, I think I'd like to open up my slides for today. Uh, some of this material comes from chapter eight, but the majority of it is covered in chapter nine of the book. I think this is a tricky topic. I think recursion itself is, is difficult to understand, but I think this particular stuff this week is sort of like another tricky concept layered on top of recursion. So uh, I think when I was taking the equivalent of this class back in you know 1864 when I went to college, um, I found this topic <laughs> tricky. And just as a teacher, when I was first teaching this class, I found this topic tricky to teach. So uh, you know, it's. I think it's certainly something we can master, but I, I think just like when we're learning recursion, it takes time to practice and get good at this stuff. So I especially encourage you to practice uh, problems. I encourage you to watch videos and just try to build your, your knowledge on this topic over time. Um, okay, so let's talk about something called an exhaustive search. That's one where you're tired at the end, right? Exhaustive. Never mind. Oh, boo. Uh, an exhaustive search is uh, where you check every possible option or choice or value to see which one is the right one, or maybe you like all of them, but you, you explore a space fully, searching for a solution to a problem. Now there's lots of ways you could do an exhaustive search, but certain spaces of problems you can exhaustively search using recursion. Uh, for example, last week when Ashley gave her lecture, she talked about recursively crawling a directory to print all the files. If you were searching for a particular file with a particular name, you would use similar logic, except you would use an if else on the file name to see if you had found it or not. So recursion is often a way to search a space for something. So there's lots of exhaustive search problems, printing all permutations, printing all names, trying all the passwords, because you're trying to hack into the student database to change your grades. All of this kind of stuff uh, is a place where you want to exhaustively search. So a lot of times a search space has a set of options, a set of choices, a set of values and you want to just try to do something for each of those things. So uh, let me talk about kind of general strategies you can use when solving problems like this and then we'll look at specific examples. So I think the following is a pretty good pseudocode for how to solve an exhaustive search problem. You write it basically a function that explores, that accepts a parameter that represents some set of decisions that you need to make or some set of choices that you need to make. And you have kind of an if-else structure, which is uh, basically what you would use as a recursive base case versus recursive case. The base case is, well, if, if there's no more decisions that I need to make, then, then I don't need to do anything and I'll stop. But otherwise, let's make a decision for our call. When I say ourselves, I mean like this call of the function. You know, when we have recursion, all the calls work together. They each do a small part of the overall <laughs> task, right? So this call will handle one decision. And I'll talk about what, is, what does a decision really mean, but for each possible choice I can make for this decision, I will choose it and then I will explore all of the other decisions that could follow this. And when I say explore, and then my function is also called explore, that's meant to be a recursive uh, you know, call there, definition there. So I still think this is too vague to be super understandable, so I think it will be easier to understand with a, an example. So, on your homework, one of the problems you need to do involves printing numbers in binary. So I want to do something else about numbers in binary. This is not the same as the problem on your homework. So no, I'm not, I'm not revealing your problem solution here. It's a different problem. What I want to do is I want to write a function called print 
all binary. I will pass you a number of bits, a number of binary digits. I want you to print all of the binary numbers that have exactly that many digits, all of them, okay? And I don't want you to use a loop. I want you to just do this with recursion. So, okay, we've solved recursion problems before. Recursion is about self-similarity, right? I have shown you as an example output what all the two-digit binary numbers look like. I have also shown you what all the three-digit binary numbers look like. How is this self-similar? How is printing binary numbers similar to printing other binary numbers? Yes? If you give me all the numbers that have been printed before that, and I have one that I can print one zero, one and then Yeah, yeah. I think what you said is that um, if you give me all the numbers that, that are printed, that are necessary to print two binary numbers, then the task of printing three is basically just kind of one more digit on top of that, maybe a zero or a one. So actually, let me, I can't doodle on the slide unless I exit the full screen mode. But like this thing here is all the two digit binary numbers you'll notice that that exact output appears right there and it appears right there, right? So just conceptually, if I need to print binary numbers, basically I want all the preceding number of binary numbers, but I want to prepend a zero or prepend a one onto the front of that. Does that make sense? Okay, so now the question is how do I I mean, that, that's the self-similarity, but how do I actually translate that into, into code? Well, let me jump ahead with one more slide here. Um, well, okay, actually, let me, let me jump to Qt Creator, and then we can start talking about this problem. So over here, there's a file called printbinary.cpp. Uh, and actually, I think in my file here, I called it print binary instead of print all. But I think on your homework, it's called print binary. So well, let me rename it. If you hit shift Control r I can just write print all binary. There. Okay, fine. So print all binary. It looks like this, and I wrote to do. <laughs> so what do I do? Well, it seemed like what you said was I need to print all the two digit binary numbers preceded by a zero and preceded by a one. So it's probably something like the following print a zero and then print the, you know, so if, if I'm printing the, the three-digit binary numbers. What I have to do is print a zero and then print all the two-digit binary numbers, right? And then after I do that, I need to print a one followed by all the two-digit binary numbers, right? Whenever we write recursion, uh, there's one other thing we have to always do, right? What's that? Base case. See, you guys have been trained well, right? Someday you'll wake up in a cold sweat, like 18 years from now, and you'll be like, base case, base case, base case, base case. And I'm not paying your medical bills. Um, what would be a good base case here? What's a number of digits of a binary number that's pretty easy to print that I might not even need to use recursion for? <laughs> you guys are great. You're great. Um, some people probably are thinking one digit because you just print a zero or you print a one or whatever, right? And that's true, that is pretty easy to print, but you guys are truly learning to embrace the elegant laziness that is recursive thinking, which is that one binary digit is not the easiest number of binary digits to print. Zero digits is the easiest number of binary digits to print. So it's something more like this. If the number of digits is zero, then lol do nothing at all, I don't have to do anything, else that's more like this recursive case. So when I say printing the three digit binary numbers, that would be like digits was equal to three. So it's more like if it's n digits, then this is more like n minus one digit, right? I mean, that's, you can sort of see that relationship in those numbers, right? So, okay, let's do it. Let's do C out zero, and then print the two digit binary numbers. Okay, print all binary two. Or not two. <laughs> uh, my count of digits minus one, right? N minus one, right? And then print a one, and then print all the two digit binary numbers again, right? I'm going to remove these comments because I think they're not very helpful, but, right? So that looks like maybe we've got a good start on that. 
OK, so now up here, uh, I'm going to call it with a 3. I have this other function we're going to write later, but I'll comment that out. So we'll, let's print all the three-digit binary numbers. Print all binary 3. What happens? Well, uh, oops. It prints a bunch of uh, <laughs> digits all on their own line. That doesn't look quite right. Um, that's probably because in the code, I wrote endl at the end here, right? And I don't want to endl. Endl goes down the line. I don't want to endl after each digit. I want to endl after all the digits. So maybe I'll do something like that or something. But I have to endl somewhere, don't I? Where do I endl? Like after this, maybe? After I print all the two-digit binary numbers, see out endl. And then maybe after I print all the one-digit binary You know, I've got to get these endls in the right place, right? Um, <laughs> what? Uh, what's happening? <laughs> what? There's, there's endels in my output that don't look like they're supposed to be there. This is pretty weird. Okay, so I want to back up for a second. This approach that we're using it has some good ideas in it, but it isn't going to lead us to the right answer. We're missing a few important things. I think what we need to do is we need to gather up these digits until we have all three of them. Like we're, if we're printing three digit binary numbers, we need to gather up all the digits and then once we've got three, we need to print them out. Do you know what I mean? We need to have exactly three digits before we print anything. So how do you gather up digits? Well, you can store digits just like you'd store anything else. You can store them in a variable or something, right? Now, if we're printing them as output, I think the best way to store output is just in a, in a string. But if I make a string, I kind of want this string to exist between the different calls of the recursion. As I build it up, as it grows to length three or four or whatever the length is that I want, I need to build this up over the course of the various function calls. So if I declare a string like in here, that's not really going to work because that means every single function call will have its own string. I kind of want to have a string that's like shared and passed along between these different function calls. <laughs> so the, the trick that we're going to employ here, I mentioned this very briefly last Friday when I was doing that expression solver, but I think that example was a little too nasty and tricky. But there's this trick that you can do in recursion where you write what's called a helper function that takes additional parameters. So we've been asked to solve this binary problem that takes an int and prints this output. We've decided maybe that we want additional parameters. Maybe we want uh, to pass along a string or pass along some other information. We're not really supposed to change the heading of the print all binary function. The problem was given to us with a set of parameters that are expected, and we need to write the code to work with those parameters that are expected. But if we've decided that for the purposes of recursion, we maybe want more than that, we want more parameters, what we do instead is a kind of a hack where we write some other function that takes the extra parameters that we need and then we make the required function call our function and our function does all of the real work. Okay? So that's the trick that we're going to use here. Um, and the extra parameter I want to pass is a string of output. So let's do something like this. Let's make a void print all binary helper I like to just name it helper because it makes it really clear what it's for. And what I'll do is I'll still take the int digits and I'll also take a string of output to print. And so again, maybe it's not totally clear what I'm up to here, but these endles are proving to be a problem. So what I'm going to use this string for is instead of printing each zero or printing each one, I'm going to build them up into a string of zeros and ones. And once I get three of them or however is the right many number of them, I will print the string out. Does that make sense? So like, I'll basically take this code here from the print binary that we were working on so far. I'm going to cut it and paste it up here, except I'll change these calls to say helper, helper. And the idea is that this function here, the one that I'm be being actually asked to write for this problem, I'm just going to use it to jump to this other function that's really going to do the work. So I'll just say print all binary helper, and I'll pass digits and then I'll pass some sort of string of output. What initially is the output that I have made at the start of all of this? If I'm just beginning, like this is the beginning of the recursion process, what output have I made at that point? Just nothing, just an empty string, right? I heard a couple people mumbling or whispering it or whatever. Okay, fine. 
So now what I'm going to do is instead of printing these zeros and ones, I'm going to put zeros and ones on my string of output that I'm building. Okay? And so the meaning of this parameter is going to capture this output that we want to print. So I'm going to comment this out, and I'm going to comment this out. I have to pass a string of output to this recursive call. And the output that I'm passing is something like 0 for this call, and it's something like 1 for that call. Does that make sense? So instead of C outing these, I'm passing them along as this string. OK, but <clears throat> you'll notice if you have sharp eyes that nowhere in the code do I actually print anything anymore, right? So my deductive powers tell me that we're not going to see any output unless there's a C out statement somewhere. So where should there be a C out statement? I'm building off these strings of output. Where do they eventually get printed? What do you think? Base case? Well, yes, that's always a good answer to any question in recursion week. And in this case, it happens to be a correct answer. Um, yeah, you're going to print these strings in the base case. So I think the idea is you call print binary of 3, which calls print binary of 2, which calls print binary of 1, which calls print binary of 0. And all of those calls along the way are building up this string. And eventually, when you get to print binary of 0, you say, ta-da, I've got a string. Let's print the string that I have been building. So instead of lol do nothing, actually I'll do C out the output endl. Okay? So this is still the base case. Print the string we have built. The recursive case is going to build up the zeros and ones. Now this code is not quite right still. If I run this, I see even worse output than what we had before. So, okay, I want to talk about why it still doesn't work. We're, we're very close to having the right answer. And I think as with many recursive algorithms, it's hard to understand what's really going on unless you insert some temporary output for debugging purposes. I even do this even though I supposedly know what I'm doing already with recursion. It's sometimes tricky to understand your code. I will insert a C out that says print helper and I'll print the digits and then I'll print in nested quote marks, I'll print the output. So this is me just tracing through those calls, okay? And here's what I see. Print binary of 3 with no string, <laughs> then print binary of 2 with a 0, then print binary of 1 with a 0. Hmm. Okay. I still think that's a little bit hard to read. So I'll tell you that um, I have a, a special debugging function that I think makes this a little easier to see, which you don't have to use in your homework or whatever, but I like to do it in lecture because I think it helps make the, the output easier to understand. So I have a heading, I don't know if I've included it, it's called recursion.h. Somebody sent me an email saying it would be, be funny if that header included itself. You know, because anyway. Uh, but it doesn't, but, or does it? Maybe I inserted that somewhere. Does it include itself? No, that'd be funny though. Um, <laughs> so uh, what that gives you is a new function that you can call named recursion indent. And if you insert that, what it'll do is it'll indent over your output lines based on how many levels of recursion deep that you are in right now. And so that turns the output into this. Recursion 3 calls recursion 2, which calls recursion 1, which calls recursion 0, which finally prints a thing. Recursion 1 after that also calls this with a 1. So do you see how like each call leads to two other calls? Do you see that? And then this call here led to that, and it led to, uh oh, no, don't rearrange my apps. Ah, <laughs> oops. And it leads also to that. So do you see how like each call forks into two smaller calls after it? I think it's pretty hard to see what's going on, but that's my attempt to show you that. I think I have a picture on the slides that's also trying to illustrate that. Where is that? Uh, here. So if you call print binary, each call makes two more calls, which makes two more calls, which makes two more calls. It makes sense because it's binary, so you kind of have a zero call and a one call. Now, a lot of the recursion that we've seen so far, almost all of it, each call makes exactly one recursive call. 
That's kind of the typical simplest recursive process that we've seen in a lot of our examples, right? Here's a case where you make multiple calls at each level. And the reason you make multiple calls is because you're exploring all of the options. Think about this problem. You're like, it's my job. I'm call number one or I'm call number two. My duty is to pick the value of one digit in this binary output. What could I pick? I could pick a zero or I could pick a one. But really what I need to do is I need to try picking both of them. I need to try a zero first and let that be and see what happens when I do that. And then after that's done, I also need to try picking a one. It's not that I'm only choosing one or the other. It's that I'm going to try both. I'm going to exhaustively search the space of the binary numbers. OK, the problem that we have in our code so far, maybe some of you have seen it. I'll ask you in a second. The reason we added that string was because I wanted to build up output between all of the calls. So that when you got to the base case, you would have accumulated this big string of zeros or ones or whatever, so you could print out that string and you see the binary number. That was the goal. Our code doesn't quite do that. <coughs> do you understand what's wrong with our code or what it needs to do in order for the string to grow and accumulate over time? What's wrong and how do I fix it? Yeah. Yes, the problem is that, think about, yeah, you're absolutely right. What you said was, instead of just printing zero, or passing zero, I need to pass like the output that was before me and a zero. So think about the chain of all these calls calling each other. The first call is passed an empty string of output. They pass on to their follower a single character string of output. Those functions should pass on to their followers a two character string of output. Those followers of followers should pass on to their followers a three character string of output. So this string needs to be adding a character to what was sent to me from the person before me. So what you really need to do is, hey, the previous call sent me some output. I want that output, and I want that output followed by a zero. Then I also want to try that output followed by a one. So if you're tracing through these calls, the initial call passing the empty string, empty string plus zero or one is just zero or one. But after that, those one character strings are going to get zeros and ones appended onto them and so forth. So let's again run our, uh, our example of output to see the, the different calls here. So here's what I get. I call print helper with three digits with an empty string. And that makes two recursive calls. <laughs> Stop it, apps. Stop it, doc. Uh, OK, wait, I can do this. I swear I've used comp Isn't it so annoying? You guys, I, it can't be that much different than when I was in school. I hated it how all my teachers were so shitty at using computers. It took them 15 minutes to plug in the projector. And usually the resolution's all shit, so everything's the wrong size, right? And then they make their fonts like this big, and they're like, any questions? Make the fucking font big enough for me to read it, right? Am I right? Back there, you can't read this. You got better eyes than me. I'm old, but I know you can't read this. Make the font big. Make the windows the right size. That's all I ever wanted. And now I'm doing it as a teacher. OK, so um, I added this control plus, because I am in the crusade against small fonts. I'm a font elitist. Um, so OK, the print helper of three makes two calls. It makes a print helper of two, where it's got a zero. And it makes a print helper of two. Uh, sorry, I can't draw. But it makes a print helper of two call that is followed by a one. So do you see that? It forks into those two calls. And you can tell it's that way because of indentation, right? The print helper two that starts with a zero says, OK, let me explore what could follow that zero. I could follow that zero with another zero, or I could follow that zero with a one. So I will make those as my two recursive calls. And then this guy with the two zeros says, well, what could follow those? I could follow the two zeros with a zero or with a one. And so this call makes these two calls. And then these two calls, you see a little gap here. That's because over on the side, these two calls say, hey, the number of digits is zero. I'm a base case. So I will print out the string that me and all of my call buddies have built. The string we built was zero, zero, zero. That appears as output. Then this guy's done. So he goes back to. The parent up here, which moves on to the second call, which does this one. Base case, print this. And so basically, the output ends up printing out is all the different possibilities, all the different binary numbers that exist. 
Now, this kind of bends your brain uh, you know, into a pretzel, I think, the first couple times you look at this type of code. I think it's kind of hard to, to write code like this or even to look at it and understand what it's doing. You know? But I hope that you're kind of starting to become convinced that this code explores and prints these strings that represent all of the binary numbers with a given number of digits. If I turn off my print statement and I go up to main, I could try it with four bits. And, oops. Uh, wait, why do I have so many blank lines here? Did I, did I omit some kind of, uh, wait, why do I have blank lines? Oh, I've got endles here. I don't want these endles here, sorry. The only endles should come after I print a string of output. So let me try it again. So I think it's, I think that looks right. It says print binary three, but it should be, it should say four. So there, I think that's all of the different uh, four digit binary numbers. And of course the self-similarity is there again because this chunk here is all the three digit binary numbers and that same chunk appears again in the second half of the, of the output. Okay, so I think the lesson we take away here is that if you want to exhaustively explore a space, your function call will often make multiple successor calls. One for each possible choice it could make. You still have the same principle of like, we're all in this together, band of brothers and sisters. Each little function call is going to do a little bit of the work. And you have the same reasoning about what that chunk of work might be. Well, if we're making digits, we're picking digits, maybe I will handle one digit. If you want to do a 10-digit binary number, that sounds hard. I don't know how to do that, but I will do one of the 10 digits. That's not so bad. So the same reasoning about each of us doing our little share of the work, that's still there. But what's different is instead of me just handing on to one successor function call, I make a set of successor function calls. In this case, two, sometimes more. And eventually, after the results of all those function calls accumulate, I will have built something. All of us together will have built something. And that something in this case took the form of a string that we were accumulating. Once we have finished building that thing, we will display it or do something with it but then the function calls will proceed to their other successor function calls and we will end up building lots of different things. We will build all of the possible options, all of the possible combinations that are there. So code like this also kind of inverts, in my mind, what the base case is or what it means. We have talked about the base case as like, this is the simple version of the problem. This is the easy version. This is the, the if you're doing a factorial, the easy factorial is a zero factorial or one factorial. Or if you're reversing a string, it's the string that's easy to reverse. It's empty or it's one letter, it, you know, and that's fine. That's still kind of what we're doing here. But in this case, it's less that the problem was easy and the main asked us to print zero digits. It's not quite that. It's more that my predecessor function call asked me to print zero digits. We're a stack of calls, and there was a call of four digits, and a call of three digits, and a call of two digits, and a call of one digits, and I am a call of zero digits. I don't have very much work to do, except all the guys before me did a bunch of work. I have to take all the work they did and display it. So the base case now could be thought of as the culmination, the end point of all the work of all the calls that came before it, as opposed to being the entry point that's easy, that doesn't do any work. So, I mean, this is how I think about these things. And it takes a while to get used to. Um, do you guys have any questions so far about, about this code, about what we wrote so far? Uh, yes? So why do we need the turn all binary pitches? Why do we need the print all binary? That's a great question. Why don't I just call this? Up in main, I could just call print binary helper, or I could rename print binary helper to print all binary. I think the reason is that maybe the person who specifies this problem says, I want you to write this function, and I want it to take exactly these parameters and no more. And for you to satisfy my requirement, that has to be true. But then you say, well, but in order to do the recursion, I want to pass this string. And so there's a mismatch between those two things. And so the way that you can obey my constraint of you only get the int parameter, but you also get to kind of have a string to play with in the recursion is that you make another function that has the string and you make the required function call your function. And as long as your function's recursive, you, then you basically follow the constraints I was asking for. So, yeah. But you're right, if we were just doing this code for ourselves and we didn't have any external constraints upon us at all, we could just only write the helper and have main call the helper and main, main would then have to pass this empty string to start the process, but otherwise that would be fine. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, could you explain why you're adding 0 and 1 to the end of output if you wanted to like, add into the beginning? 
oh, why not, why not put zero at the front, like zero plus output, one plus output? I guess it's because like the output is the stuff that the calls before me did. And so I feel like what I'm doing in my call is adding on to what they did. So it's their work plus my work. My work is a zero, then my work is a one. It would still work if I moved it to be the other way, except I think the order in which the combinations printed out would change. And I'm happy to run it that way to show it. There's nothing incorrect about it unless the problem statement said that the order needed to match my order. Um, so it prints them in a little bit different order. Do you see how the one here it flips first because the first call, well, the, the first three calls pick uh, zeros and the fourth call picks a zero, but then when the fourth call picks its one, its one is at the front. So, I mean, it still works. Um, I like it the other way just because I like to think of it as each call adds to the end of what came before it, but there's nothing wrong about the other order. Okay. Uh, just as a quick exercise, if you want to do this with base 10 numbers, with decimal numbers, I'm not going to code this one live because I want to keep moving, but if you do it with base 10, you basically end up with a similar kind of problem, except instead of just 0 and 1, you have all 10 of the numeric digits, right? So how do you do it? Well, <laughs> you can use recursion and a loop together. Instead of having just two calls that fork off from each existing call, you have 10. And I don't know if I have a picture of the tree of those, but basically the function looks like this. Instead of saying call the helper with a zero and call the helper with a one, you say for each number zero through nine, call the helper with that number i. And now you might say, wait, Marty, you said no recursion and loops. You can't mix those together. You said no loops. Well, uh, there are some cases like this where the loop is an elegant way of describing the different successor function calls to make, but the overall process is still recursive. So in this problem, if I were asking you to solve this as homework or test or something, I would say you can use a loop as long as your overall process is a recursive process. You can look at this code later or trace it later, but it's basically the exact same code, except that I'm looping over 10 numbers to make a recursive call instead of just manually mentioning two numbers to make function calls. Okay? And I could write this out as a call with a zero and a call with a one and a call with a two. I could write out 10 lines of code, each with a call. That would be okay. So that's the only difference in that one. I just wanted to show you that sometimes a loop is okay. Okay, let's look at another problem. So there's this particular variation of this exhaustive search which is called backtracking. Backtracking is when you're doing an exhaustive search, you're trying to find a solution, you're trying to find a desired answer or output, but sometimes along the way of searching for it, you get into what you might call a bad state where you don't like where you have gotten and you want to backtrack and try a different option. Now in the previous problem, there was no such issue because we wanted to print all of the binary numbers. But sometimes I don't want to print them all, I don't want to process them all, I want to find certain ones. So here are some examples where you might want to do that. You might want to search for anagrams of a word or solve a crossword puzzle or do a chess playing move strategy. And a chess board is a good example. You know, the deep blue computer that plays Kasparov and all that stuff. The way its brain works is it tries all these different chess moves and then it checks to see how good they turn out. And if it's bad, it backs up and tries a different move. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Backtrack. You try a bunch of options, backtrack if you don't like how things are going. So let's look at a specific example. Um, well, I right, sorry, first I'll show you the, the pseudocode for how to do backtracking is basically the exact same as the pseudocode for doing exhaustive search, except as you're choosing things and exploring them, you also do what's called unchoosing. You also backtrack if you don't like where you are. So I have this kind of mantra that I use this week, and you'll probably hear it again over and over. You'll hear it in section, which I call the choose, explore, unchoose paradigm. And I think that will become more understandable as we look at some code. So let me just, without further, further ado, try to get to a demo of a problem. I want to write a function with you guys called dice sum. I'll pass you an int representing a number of six-sided dice that I want to roll. I will also pass you a sum, and I'm trying to figure out all the combinations of dice values where if you add that many dice up, where you'll get that exact sum. So dice sum 2, 7 prints all the ways that two dice could roll to give you exactly a 7. Dice sum 3, 7 is all the ways that three dice can be rolled to give you exactly a 7. Got it? Now, this one, uh, in the binary thing, the self-similarity 
was really obvious in the screen because you could take the two digit binary numbers and just sort of superimpose them over on the right, and there they were. But that's not quite true here. I mean, you don't see that output over on the right. If you think about the nature of the problem, that should seem clear why that would be. But, okay. There are a lot of things this problem does have in common with the printing binary problem. It's still recursive. You still have each call doing some amount of the work. And we need to keep track of the work that we have done along the way. Similar to the way we used a string to keep track of work when we were making binary numbers, okay? So, let me ask you some questions. What is the unit of work if you've got lots of function calls working together? We're trying to find all the ways that the three dice can add up, or whatever number of dice. What do you think is sort of the unit of work that each function call might handle? What do you say? Rolling one die. Okay, sure. So if there's maybe three dice, then we'll do three function calls. One will handle each die. Okay, what does it mean to handle a die? If I'm going to take, I got the second die. I got it. I got it. I got it. What does that mean? What am I going to do? I'm, I guess I'm deciding what its value will be, but can you be a little more specific? I mean, you're totally right, but what, is, what value will it have then? What, what am I going to do with it? We're talking about exploring, exhaustively searching, backtracking. Like, what is it about its value that I'm going to even do with this dot? Any thoughts? What do you say? Um, if you roll it and then you subtract whatever value it gets from the original amount that you want, and then the next die roll it has to sum to that new value. Okay, so roll it, and then if I roll a five, then now that's five out of the sum I'm trying to get to. <laughs> So, right, I need to try out different values to see if they get me to the target or get me close to the target. But I'm going to try all the values. I'm going to try one through six because I don't know what one is going to work. Actually, several values might work. If I'm a second die, there's lots of different values for me that could work. So I have to try them all and find all the good combinations. So that's the kind of the thought process here. Okay, let's also think about base cases. How many dice are easy to roll? Zero dice, <laughs> right? Maybe one die is fairly easy to roll, but I'm much lazier than that. Zero dice is the easiest number of dice to roll uh, where you don't do anything. Okay, so um, let's try to write this dice solver. Uh, the function we're gonna write is called dice sum. It takes a number of dice and a desired sum. Okay, let's try to do it. If the number of dice is zero, Lol, do nothing. That sounds familiar from the last problem. If there's at least one die, I will need to try, so I will handle one die, try all possible values, which means one through six, to see if they can work, right? So in other words, what that means is, I'll try my die being one and then see what could happen. Then I'll try my die being two and see what could happen. Then I'll try my die being three and so on. Okay, well to try the numbers one through six, I can use a for loop for that, right? For loop int i equals one, i goes up to six, i plus plus. For each of those values, for each of those values, I'm going to choose i as my value then I'm going to explore what could follow that. And then after I'm done exploring that, I'm going to unchoose i. That's what I need to do. How do I choose things? Well, in the binary problem, how did we choose digits? How did we remember what we had chosen? We put it into that string, right? Great. The output here looks kind of like that. Not coincidentally, that's kind of how collections look in our output in our libraries, right? So I think instead of a string here, I'd like to build up a collection of the values of the dice I've chosen so far. 
Okay, but how do I, where do I put that collection? Well, I hope you're seeing a similarity to the binary problem. There's no collection here. If I want there to be a collection, I should add that. I should make a parameter out of that and kind of grow that collection over time, just in the same way that I grew the string over time when I was doing binary numbers. So a collection of dice roll values, a collection of ints, maybe a vector. So why don't I really make a dice sum followed by a dice sum helper, and what I'll add is a vector of ints, which is the values that I have chosen so far. So that's just like my string from the other problem. Now when you pass collections, you normally pass them by reference or else you're going to make copies and copies and copies of them. So I'm going to pass it as a vector reference. So now just to make the calls kind of hook together, the regular dice sum needs to call the helper. So I need to call the dice sum helper to get things started. I'll pass the number of dice I'm interested in. I'll pass the desired sum I'm interested in. What do I pass for the vector? What have I initially chosen at the start of all of this? I haven't chosen anything. So the way that you would say that is you just say make a vector of ints called v or whatever and pass v. Just pass an empty vector just to get things going, okay? So now I'm going to live up in the helper. I'm going to work on that code. So what does it mean to choose i? How do I indicate, how do I remember, how do I keep track that I have chosen I. Yeah. Put it in the vector. That's what the vector is for. Store the things I have chosen. Chosen dot add I. Now I need to explore all the things that could follow that. Well, look, the part that says explore, that's the recursion part. <laughs> Just write it down. Explore means recursion. <laughs> So I need to make a recursive call where the next call should pick what should come after me choosing value i. So I'm going to call dice sum helper. What should I pass as the parameters? How many dice does the next guy need to handle? My number of dice minus one, right? Because I picked one. I picked i for my dice, for my <laughs> die. What's the desired sum that the next guy is trying to reach? whatever my sum was, except I picked a value of i, so let's chip that many away from the total that we're trying to reach, right? Desired sum minus i. And I'll pass this same vector of chosen dice that we're all kind of sharing through all these calls, okay? When I come back from that, I'm supposed to unchoose i. Well, we can come back to that in a second if you want. But look, I want to talk about this base case. I wrote lol do nothing. That's not usually the right answer for a backtracking problem or an exhaustive search problem. I talked about what the base case means in these contexts. It means something a little bit different. It means the calls before me have done work and when it gets to my turn, there's no work left to do because all the other calls did all the work. So what's my job if I'm on a case of zero? What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to print all the great work that the calls did before me. <laughs> See out the chosen vector like that. Print all the choices that they made. Okay? Well, I don't know. We could try it. I don't know if it's going to work. But uh, I'm trying all the dice from three to get a sum of seven. So uh, on the slide, I know what the output should be for that. So let's run it and see. It looks a lot like binary numbers, doesn't it? Uh, that's because I'm forgetful, and this should be called like something else, and this file that I'm working in should be called main. Okay, great. Let's try again. Whoa! What the heck? Uh, wow! <laughs> if your vector keeps growing for more than four hours, call your doctor. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> this vector keeps growing and growing and growing. At some point, we need to pull things back out of the vector. Because remember, we're trying to roll three dice. And at this point, we printed the vector because it had three dice in it. Right? Let's watch the function calls again. So C out, recursion indent, <coughs> followed by dice 
sum helper parentheses dice comma desired sum bless you comma and then chosen so I can just watch the calls right whoa there we go a lot of output oh my gosh <laughs> stop uh, <laughs> yeah okay so I think it's doing pretty good stuff we do dice sum three seven where nothing has been chosen then we try picking a one because keep in mind, this guy up here is going to ultimately make make six function calls. Ah. Six, six function calls. This one is one. Down here, this is another one, and so on. But <clears throat> what we need to do is we need to pick the value one, explore what could follow, and then when it comes back, we need to unpick one, and then move on to two. Explore two. Come back. Unpick two. Pick three, explore what could follow three, come back, unpick three. Do you understand? Like, we need to reverse, like if we're adding things to this vector and we make recursive calls, when those calls come back, we should put the vector back how it was before so that the vector doesn't grow and grow and grow like this. So um, that is what we call this unchoose step here. How do I undo my choice? Well. Look, it's usually exactly the opposite of what you did when you made the choice. The choice was I put the number i in the vector. Now I want to undo that, so I need to remove the value i from the vector. Be a little careful, because if you just say chosen.remove i, that's not quite right, because that remove, the parameter to remove, is not a value to remove. It is an index from which to remove, which means that's not going to do what you want. I think there's a method called remove back which means just remove the last element, which the last one that was added is mine, so I think that'll, that'll do what I want. But that's the unchoosing. Now if I run this again, it's still going to produce a lot of output. But now the output looks a little more reasonable. It prints 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116. We're getting somewhere. We're doing something a little bit better, except, oops, we're printing every single possible combination of dice, right? That's not exactly what we were supposed to do. This is still neat. We have exhaustively printed them all, but we didn't quite solve the overall problem, which was I wanted to print the ones that added up to a particular sum, right? So how do I incorporate that into my solution? Let me present to you a way that actually is not ideal for that. What we could do is, right at this moment when we're about to print this, we could say, you know, one plus one plus, wait a minute, that's the wrong sum. And then we could just not print it if the sum is wrong, right? That seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do maybe. Right here in the base case, I could say, hey, if the sum of the vector is right, then print it out. How do I know if the sum of the vector is right? How do I know? Well, I could loop over the vector and add it up. But there's something simpler than that that I can do. What do you say? If the desired sum is exactly zero, that means that the succession of choices along the way chipped away exactly enough from the desired sum until it was whittled down to zero. As opposed to if it's still five, I didn't chip it away enough. Or if it's negative 17, I chipped it away too far. So right, if the desired sum is zero, I hope you understand what that means is that the calls perfectly found the right total. So I run it again, and I, I tell you what, I'm going to turn off that debugging output because I don't think it's helping at this instant. So let me run it again. Hey, I've got the output. Yes, I did it. And all that matters is whether we get the right output, as you learned and you got your grade back for homework one, right? Oh, wait, no. We're mean and strict and we care about algorithms, we care about style, we care about efficiency. I have to go in a second, you have to go in a second, but what's maybe not ideal about this solution? Yes? You're still calculating with like negative or like invalid basically, so the desired sum is going to a negative value. I'm going to do it. Right. I'll end you with this picture and then we'll go home. Well, I won't end you, but I'll end the lecture with this picture. I will end you. Um, our code still walks through this whole tree of possibilities, even ones that have no chance of being right because they're so far from the right answer. 
We don't need to do that. We could make a code more efficient so that it avoids doing stuff like that. I will explore that on Wednesday when we resume from here. But you can think about that between then and now. See you next time. Thanks.